Well, we were trailing ahead in the previous panel to universal health coverage. And indeed, it is a road, it's a journey, and it's a key goal, as you know, of the Sustainable Agenda for 2030. And the WHO estimates that half the world's population lacks access to basic health services. And UHC, it's aspirational, it promises to give all people greater access to high quality health services without the fear of financial hardship. So in this panel, we're going to be looking at financing as well as putting primary health care in the focus and looking at non-communicable diseases. And as you can see, I have a very illustrious panel. In fact, I don't even need to mention their names. I would just ask you to read who uh, they are. can guess who's who, right? <laughs> <laughs> and now we're going to guess who. Some of you, of course, will know who some of these are, but I'm going to give uh, the floor, first of all, to uh, Ilona Kickbush, uh, who will, many of you will know that uh, she's the Director of Public Health at the Graduate Institute, and I am not being paid by her, but she has written a book called The Road to Universal Health Coverage, which Geoffrey Sturchio, a previous panelist, was uh, involved in too. So we do have an expert here, and that's why I thought that I'd just start the discussion, Ilona, with asking you, you know, what is it, and why does the healthcare community think that it's the best policy uh, platform for achieving health for all and well-being for all? Well, thank you very much. You've already mentioned, of course, that it's uh, one of the core targets in the SDG3. And uh, it's a very symbolic target, 3.8, because what it actually tries to bring across is to say, in global health, we need a comprehensive approach. We need to move out of what some people, and I also call the disease silos. So that's one of the greatest challenges. How do we create a comprehensive system, a system across the full spectrum? And I think that's very important, and I'm sure Dr. Axelrod will come back to that, how that full uh, spectrum is ensured. I'd like to highlight five points about universal health coverage, which is also a kind of code word. Of course, you can approach it very, very technically, and then sort of say, you know, it's this, 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 and there are people who are, you know, looking at it in great detail and, in my view, are nearly making the same mistake as with primary health care to say, here's universal health coverage and here is essential universal health coverage, just like we had primary health care and selective primary health care. But, of course, that's also related partly to the question, how do we uh, measure it? And uh, then, of course, you are looking for specific indicators, and I'm sure Bob might come back to that. Let me just highlight those five areas. One, you've alluded to UHC stands for that health is a human right. And that's a commitment to equity that every person has access to health care. And then there's, of course, a range of things that follow from that. It's not just any old care. It's good care. It's high quality care. All of those things. And that this is a right that people can expect from governments, from their government. The WHO Constitution says health is a social responsibility of governments. And of course, international organizations try to support governments uh, to be able to promote that right. The second is that universal health coverage stands for is that health is an investment. If you invest in your health system, full spectrum again, and some of the related things, you know, social determinants of health, etc. But really, health is an investment. So particularly if you're a country on the road to development, it's one of the best choices you have. And I'm sure the uh, other panelists will, will underline that. But that's also a message to the decision makers in a country, but also to investors, to development banks, to those, uh, I mean, de overseas development aid is only a teensy bit. You know, you can't finance a health system through uh, those uh, meager contributions with hardly any countries reaching 0 0.7. 
So uh, that's the investment. The third is, and I think that's really, really critical for UHC, that health is a social contract. And this relates to the point that you indicated that nobody should fall into poverty or suffer financial hardship because they need to go to a doctor or a hospital or have some kind of health problem. And that means as a government you have to establish a system that ensures that. Now WHO doesn't say what kind of system that is. Usually countries have mixed system. But there's a significant part of public sector responsibility within such a system, particularly for the poorest. So uh, it's important to discuss around that, the health services people need. But part of that social contract is not only the money, it's also the people-centered health services. Because nowadays, you can only, with you know, chronic disease again, you can only deliver health services if the patient themselves, the community, the family uh, contributes. The fourth thing is that it is a political choice. And that relates back again to this issue of increased political commitment by governments to invest in health services. There's a significant role of the state. There's government stewardship. There's a lot of those things. I hope we can discuss it more. And finally, finally, there is, you know, health is an economic force. Uh, in our book, uh, we draw attention to the fact that, you know, the health economy globally is about 10 trillion US dollars. And that's money both in the public and the private sector. It's money that you pay for your health workforce. It's money that you invest in public services, et cetera. And we need to find a way uh, to bring those, uh, those things together. So, you know, UHC in the simplest of all terms is nobody should have financial hardship if they uh, need to access care and they need to have high quality care. But it's not only something technical. It's really, it's a value, it's a social contract, it's a commitment. And unless we really pick up that political dimension of primary health care and universal health coverage, we are not going to get there. Thank you very, very much for setting the scene there. And if I can bring uh, Svetlana in, because of course, universal health coverage is one of your pri priorities. And I, I was wondering, is it for you about having a greater emphasis on primary health care? Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak on this panel and with this distinguished panelist. Of course, uh, I would like maybe to start with the NCDs. What is the NCDs? NCDs, as we call it, non-communicable diseases, is the biggest killer in the world. They are responsible for 71% of all deaths worldwide. It is 41 million every year people are dying from non-communicable diseases. And there are four biggest main non-communicable diseases, as we call it. It is the cardiovascular diseases, cancer, chronic lung diseases, and diabetes. And uh, uh, now we also recognize that the mental health disorders is the part of the CNCD agenda. And of course, it is a uh, big numbers, and uh, as a mental health, it is uh, also that just a few numbers. This is a... Uh, 800,000 people are dying from suicide every year. It's terrible. And 300 million people are suffering from dementia. Oh, sorry, uh, depression. So that is the numbers that uh, we have to focus on. And of course, this is the people that they need uh, primary health care. What is the primary health care? The primary health care is the, under the umbrella of UHC, and that is where we have to focus and to work on. And uh, it is the important issue that we should recognize that we should invest, invest in prevention of non-communicable diseases. There are five major risk factors, and the first one is the tobacco, the harmful use of alcohol, uh, physical inactivity, and unhealthy diet, and now we also Add in air pollution as one of the risk factors. So, preventing these risk factors, we are preventing non communicable diseases. And of course, the prevention should be at the focus of the universal health coverage the access to the medicines, the 
access to the drugs and uh, the uh, UHC for all ages to get the adequate treatment. It's an uh, extremely important part. And as, uh, as it was already said that um, this is the, the way we have to invest. And uh, as Alona said, it is, uh, the health is an investment. And we recognized it. And it was already recognized by the head of states at the last high level meeting on the non-communicable diseases, which took part in uh, last September, this September, this year in New York. And the commitment by the head of the states uh, to put the NCDs and mental health at the top of the political agenda is critical and important. And investment in, UHC, in the NCDs and UHC is the part of work that we are, WHO is providing in the countries. How we can do it? We have the number of tools and instruments. We call it best buys. And it is, uh, we have 16 uh, best buys which are evidence-based and they investment in these best buys uh, would be helpful for countries, especially for the low and middle income countries. So that is the investment for the prevention of uh, non-communicable diseases. You, you mentioned that high level meeting on non-communicable uh, diseases and there's another high level meeting uh, next year in New York on universal health coverage. So how do you build momentum after your meeting and make sure that uh, non-communicable diseases are really very high up on the uh, priority for that next meeting on universal health coverage. So this <clears throat> meeting that you said um, that took place uh, this September, it was the third high-level meeting on uh, NCDs. We have the first one in 2011, the second one was 2014, and this year was 2018 was the third one. And it was important that this year the NCDs were uh, looked and recognized in the loop of the sustainable development goals. And that is why we are now focus on the <coughs> UHC high-level meeting. The UHC high-level meeting is an opportunity for us to speak about all health. Of course, NCDs is the part of these health issues because of, the, as I said, the numbers of uh, the deaths that we got every year of NCDs. But also because investing in the prevention of NCDs is also important for us. We know that investing now in the best buys, one dollar we will get seven dollars back in uh, 2030. So that is why we have to focus and to put NCDs at the top of the priority agenda of UHC. I mean, do you feel there's enough priority given to these non-communicable diseases? This. We try to do this and of course it depends on the member states who are negotiating it. Uh, our uh, exercise as the UN agency is to provide the technical assistance, but the member states are requiring for this, and that is why this year this uh, political commitment and declaration which was adopted on NCDs was very strong, with 14 new commitments. And that is why it changed uh, the 4x4 four four agenda to 5x5 five five agenda. So that is the work of the member states. Of course, we have the different stakeholders, and uh, I can't not to say and forget about the civil society private sector, academia, and others, we are all together. We have to be as a one team to put the priority on the NCD on UHC. And uh, Gerald, if I can bring you in, because uh, you represent the NCD Alliance in East Africa, and I understand that you were a very strong advocate of uh, non-communicable diseases uh, being considered or taken seriously by the Ministry of Health uh, in, in, in Kenya a, a number of years ago. I wonder if you could just tell us uh, what the situation is in East Africa as, as far as non-communicable diseases go. Um, are they rising? Uh, which ones? How, how worried should we be? Yeah, thank you very much um, for the invitation and um, very good uh, introduction from my two colleagues. Um, for uh, East Africa, and indeed most of Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, NCDs currently account for about 30% of the mortalities uh, with uh, the communicable diseases such as HIV, malaria, tuberculosis, and other 
uh, reproductive health problems and diarrheal diseases in children, um, dealing a blow to about 65% or so uh, of the uh, mortality. But of note is that the rate of increase in deaths from NCDs is highest in this part of the world. Uh, in some of the statistics, about 27% in 10 years as compared to about 7 to 10% for the rest of the world. And the projections from the Kenya uh, Health Sector Plan uh, shows that uh, by the year 2025, uh, NCDs will account for 50% of mortality being equal to all the non-communicable diseases combined. And from there on, if we do nothing, uh, they will escalate to become the biggest killers. And 2025 is just next door. Uh, it may sound like uh, far away, but it's, it's really next door. So there's urgency and sense of emergency that uh, uh, the measures that uh, WHO has requested us to put in place are done. As far as mobility is concerned, 50% of the beds uh, in, even in public hospitals uh, are occupied uh, by NCDs, and in private hospitals is up to 70%. So it's presenting best. great challenges so to it's, the health so, system. So it's, it's, a, it's a great challenge to the health system. And uh, in universal health coverage uh, for most of these countries, and East Africa in particular, uh, UHC has been considered a major political um, uh, uh, part of the development agenda. And there, are, there have been meetings, including one early this year uh, in Kampala, where all heads of state uh, play to take UHC seriously. Uh, my only concern about the UHC is I'm still seeing very little NCDs uh, represented in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in UHC in uh, East Africa and in Sub-Saharan Africa in general. Uh, as uh, Dr. Svetlana has mentioned, Majority of the best buys for NCDs are actually in the area of health promotion and prevention because they are cost effective and affordable and sustainable. So if we're going to do incremental UHC agenda for this region, that has to be taken very seriously. And what would one of those best buys look like for you? Well, uh, we are looking at um, strengthening um, healthy diets, physical activity, and uh, decreasing uh, the effects of uh, adverse marketing uh, for unhealthy foods, alcohol and uh, tobacco. Uh, and uh, this includes strengthening of health promotion with the uh, uh, community health uh, volunteers, as they're called now, and including people living with NCDs uh, and the community in general in health promotion activities. And in addition to that, uh, including NCDs in primary health care. As we speak, a majority of the primary health care services in Sub-Saharan Africa are only for infectious diseases. People who have hypertension, diabetes, uh, will not find drugs or point of care um, uh, equipment for testing uh, at majority of the dispensaries and health centers where 80% of the population live. So I think the uh, governments need to put their money where their mouth is uh, in terms of uh, uh, including NCDs uh, in uh, universal health uh, coverage. Do you think that there should be more regulation of advertising uh, on unhealthy food, uh, tobacco, alcohol, is that the way to go? Uh, as a movement of NCD Alliance in East Africa, we have done quite a bit of peer mentoring uh, in terms of uh, increasing the regulations that relate to the big four behavioral risk factors. And we've succeeded so far in having uh, tobacco control bills in the five countries. Uh, some of them strong, some not so strong, but at least there's some elements of tobacco control bills and alcohol control bill. Our big challenge right now is with the food industry. And uh, reg regulations on this are still not there. Uh, and there's a big change in the kinds of foods that people are eating and also in physical activity. There's a bit of, quite a bit of motorization of transport, even up to rural level. And the levels of obesity are drastically increasing. The last uh, 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 step survey showed that about 37% of women are actually either overweight or obese. Uh, between 35 and 40% are either overweight or obese. Uh, in, in that particular region. So does it need stronger policies? Because we all know that perhaps uh, we shouldn't drink Coca-Cola, uh, in my yes. case, or uh, alcohol or uh, in fact, tobacco. In fact, I'm embarrassed, I'm embarrassed it, to see that on I know, uh, sorry. <laughs> they, they gave, it gave me energy, and I realised that uh, most probably we should uh, take it out of uh, 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 shot there. Yeah. Uh,
Uh, this is medicinal, you, un you understand. So exactly, I know it's not good for me, but it gives me energy. So uh, this is the issue, isn't it, with NCDs? We know that we shouldn't be doing these things. And so does it need some sort of policy nudge? Uh, and what other policies do you think uh, the governments in your region should take? I think in a region where people still have a problem with food security and malnutrition is still there, uh, and you have this nutritional transition situation whereby in, in survey, some surveys in schools, you have almost uh, about 30% uh, of kids still underweight and another 15% or more in some areas uh, already being overweight and, uh, and, 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 and obese, such that you have malnutrition in over 50% of the kids. Uh, and the transition from, uh, fr from underweight to overweight is so drastic over a short period of time so we need very comprehensive food policies that address both problems. And if they don't and, do them, we're not going to get Intertwined with agricultural <laughs> policies and education policies. Yeah. And that really calls for a multi-sectoral approach uh, to NCDs. And it's a typical example of how important a multi-sectoral approach across different ministries is. Mm. Otherwise, as you say, you're not going to hit the target uh, of universal health uh, uh, coverage. For, because N for NCDs, absolutely. You will not reach the target if we just target on uh, commodities. So health promotion and prevention for NCDs, where the most of the best buys are, needs to be taken seriously. That's part of universal health coverage. According to WHO uh, definition of health, we, we include social, uh, psychological, and emotional health as part of uh, health. So I think achievement of that is as important as uh, accessing antibiotics and the anti, anti, and anti hypertensives Emmanuel, if I can bring you in from, from Ghana, and perhaps logically I need to ask you about NCDs in Ghana and whether you've got the same sort of uh, con concerns that Gerald has mentioned, and what are you doing as a government to try and uh, uh, regulate or find the right policies so that uh, this uh, epidemic of non-communicable diseases is uh, reduced? Yeah, so thank you once again for the opportunity and I also want to thank the organizers for giving us the opportunity to be here today. I think I want to say that, uh, like I always say, doing the wrong thing at the right time is wrong and the right thing at the wrong time is equally wrong. So having the right event at the right time is what makes it wrong. And like Victor Hugo once said, that there's not like an, an idea whose time has come. So I think we are here today at the very opportune time in history to really examine NCD in a broader perspective. As a country, Ghana, we, we realize that there's an upset of NCDs, like you really stated, and based on our step survey, so it's like about 38%, and even on the rise. But critically, what we've also realized is that a lot of disruptive innovation must happen if we really want to go around NCDs and its cabinets. So one of the things we did, and this was strictly in partnership with the private sector, we worked with the Novartis Foundation and set up some pilots in two districts in, in one part of the country where basically we use lower cadre of staff, what we call the CVD nurses, cardiovascular disease nurses, and follow them up over a year. And really realize that most of them, the care that they would have had at the higher point at the district hospital, basic transport costs, they couldn't even go for their, their refills. So at that lower point, we were trained on basic things they, they could do. And after assessment, we realized that systolic blood pressures had reduced from about 150 something to about 140 something millimeters per mercury that solid blood pressures has also reduced drastically from about 87 to 84. So critically, we could see some progress and we deployed technology and water, water phones. And so we deployed just basic training, even when they should refer. So really one of the best buys we have seen across the continent would be really thinking in context across the structure of the country and seeing how best we can deploy this things. Knowing really that in most parts of Africa, we don't even have the healthcare workers at the optimal levels based on our staffing norms to really go around these issues. So we really want to hamper on disruptive innovation and the fact that countries should really think context specific on how best to go around the NCD mandate. And, and just to, mm, sorry, sorry just to add on to say that NCD, like we rightly say, is a lifestyle disease. So I also think that even a conversation should go around with the healthcare workers. Because if you see lifestyle, then it goes into the realm of culture. It goes into the way of the way people think. And that's why I think the whole area of behavioral science should be deployed in full, which we're looking at how we employ behavioral science techniques into, into people's behaviors, like this cook in front of you. 
could have found a way to get you to know that you don't need to take cook in a way that will, will, will relate to your culture. And especially in Africa, where there's a lot of tribal states moving into nation states. The same, the same country move from one region to the next region, even, or even the same region, and the people think completely different. And so it's also about the whole realm of how we, we deploy our anthropology to so really understand our culture and looking at our policy streams in line with the culture and do, having specific policy interventions. Because I always say this in Ghana, you go to the rural communities in Ghana, and most of the norms in the village is not written in any document, but the people follow them religiously. And most of the norms we've written, we've documented, we've taken to parliament, act passed, are always disobeyed. So the way that these norms are able to, people are able to leave these norms, we need to get those things right in terms of behaviors and be able to put our interventions on the same platform. More, more yeah. investment in behavioral yes. science. Yes. Is this something that also uh, you are advocating for at the NCD Alliance? Yes, um, I think the, the um, ad evidence for policy and evidence uh, that uh, actions are working and monitoring them is very important. And um, the, one of the important sectors that we include in our alliance is the academia and research institutions so that there is a evidence-based policy and action and, and monitoring framework uh, at country level that uh, reinforces policy and revises policy over time. You were mentioning uh, a partnership with Novartis, I think, in, in, in that particular uh, instance. And whether it's on NCDs or communicable diseases, um, is that the way uh, to, to go? What role do you see for the private sector? Yeah, so, like most of the estimates we've done, most low developing countries to achieve the SDGs, the UAC, who runs into billions of dollars. No government can really single-handedly fund most of these interventions. So for, for us in Ghana, and I think in most parts of the world, we really come to we really need to see the private sector and see how we're able to work hand in hand in a win-win situation. So like we do the Novartis Foundation, they piloted it in government work with them hand in hand to pilot using our systems, and then we share the results. And based on that, we are scaling up in another two more districts. So this is something we really want to recommend, that there are also lessons in private sector that public sector executives or bureaucrats might want to understand. Even raising funds, because clearly one of the things that has come up strongly is that we need to raise a lot of domestic resources. Raising domestic resources really doesn't come into the culture of public sector executives. The private sector is has more experience in raising funds. So maybe now the term public sector entrepreneur might not necessarily be an oxymoron. It might be something that we might want to be looking at in, in, in more clearer terms. And then even when it comes to the research and the development of, of them. This is a, an area private sector really comes in hand in hand. And we are very great and um, happy that looking at the seven accelerators with the Global Action Plan that was uh, submitted by His Excellency the President of Ghana and the leadership of Germany and Norway. One of the accelerators was research and development and also innovation and access. So research and development is also an area where government can work hand in hand in the private sector to see how best we can deploy new technologies. Because clearly, if you pick a communities in Ghana, there are places where you can't even have these things in cool chain to that, that last door. How do you get it there? So this is where a lot of research and development will be key. How do we get some of these drugs in ways that can move in such settings? People live in, on island communities. People, people live in riverine communities. How do we get drugs in, in stages where they can still deploy them without the strict temperature controls? So there's a lot of R&D that really has to go on, and this is where public-private sector partnerships will be key moving towards this. Mm. And, and what do you think, it's all about trust, as we've heard, uh, between the, the private sector and, and governments. What do you think needs to be done to build that trust so that it is seen as a win-win and uh, there's not uh, you know, skepticism that the pharmaceutical industry is only thinking about itself and, and not about, about the country? Yeah, I think key. Because let's face it, now currently the world is, like, uh, let's say VUCA, it's volatile, it's uncertain, it's complex, and it's ambiguous. So really, it means clear that rules and processes might not really be work too much as compared to trust. So really, building trust is something that will become very critical in the 21st century. And we need to build that trust with the private sector. And that means we need to sit down with the private sector properly, understand the inherent interest in the private sector, their bottom lines. The private sector needs to understand government properly. And then that's why I'm happy with the engagement that has been looked at within the UAC 2030. The, 
private sector engagement. I think there will be some meetings with the World Economic Forum later on. Really to see how we really understand those uh, private sector partnerships clearly. And even moving into the African countries, the real private sector funds, you know, the alliances have not also been streamlined properly. I know Kenya has done quite a lot with the private health sector alliance. But in most parts of Africa, those alliances are not very strong. So there's always that mistrust between the public and the private sector. And I think with this engagement coming on, with most alliances coming on board, they're sitting there more of these forums of this sort, talking to the private sector. We can gradually build that confidence and be able to navigate around it. Ilona, if I can bring you in, and I really don't want to do too much publicity for your book, <laughs> but it was about the private sector, wasn't it? And the role and the, the, the private sector can play and the risks and the benefits. And I wondered whether you might be able to share some edited highlights very briefly. Well, actually, the book is broader because uh, we feel very strongly that uh, countries, even also international organizations and even economists, have not looked enough at what the health economy actually means for countries and for global flows of capital, investment, et cetera. Particularly as countries you know, continue to build their health systems as they need to invest, uh, there is an enormous need for money, for capital, for ideas, for innovation, for partnerships. And that's actually what we try to do. We try to show what that health economy consists of, and that the health economy, of course, is not only the private sector, but uh, that you know, it's generating resources for a country, which is you know, the notion of investment. It's about what it means if you build a health system and you need nurses, which means you educate women, which means you, know, you send your kids to school. So our book is really a plea for that. And then it shows in various chapters with contributions from international organization, public sector, and private sector, how they are trying to contribute to this larger agenda. Because what we try to do is move away from a, a very simplistic juxtaposing, you know, here is the public and here is the private. You know, there are good things here, there are good things here, there are bad things here. I mean, we've got a heck of a lot of corruption in the public sector. And, you know, we've got problems in the private sector. So actually ensuring, you mentioned trust, ensuring that each of the sectors can be trusted, that, you know, they do work to uh, common agendas where, in quotes, they can both profit, let me put that in inverted commas, you know, that the country, and with that also the world as a whole trying to reach the SDGs, uh, can benefit. And I just want to add one thing also. I always have a problem if we talk about the private sector. Uh, the private sector, just like the public sector. I mean, the public sector, we've at least moved to talking about multi-sectoral and that the finance ministry doesn't necessarily want to do what uh, uh, the health ministry wants to do. But, you know, the private sector consists of an enormous amount of very, very different kinds of sectors, companies. You know, they can be logistic, and gosh, do we need them, you know. They can be tobacco, and oh, no, we don't want them. Uh, they can be pharma, and it's so-so, you know. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. But you know, let's start to be specific, and let's be specific what we mean with partnership. Because you know, there are people in the private sector one does not want to partner with. Actually, WHO says we're not allowed to do so. The Framework Convention says that. And there are others, you know, take the emergency agenda, uh, without whom you know, we, we couldn't fight an emergency. Because they have the knowledge, they have uh, the, the means. But, and we're also seeing, if I might add that, because of your bottle, <laughs> it changes. You know, 10 years ago, most of us said, let's use the logistics and the fact that certain companies, you know, reach furthest into the last desert. Mm -hmm. uh, let's use that for vaccines. And suddenly we're seeing, oops, not that easy. Because those companies are actually a danger for something else, and that is NCDs. So, you know, even our, the way we see the private sector changes. Initially, it said, 
thank God my kid drinks this stuff and not alcohol. And suddenly, you know, both aren't really that good. So I think that we progress in our evidence, in our knowledge, and that differentiates how we work with whom. And that, I think, will become more and more important the larger this health economy becomes. I'd very much like, because Bob has been very silent, as you've noticed, but uh, this, this, is, this is the man who uh, knows uh, a lot about uh, financing uh, universal uh, health coverage. And there are various different uh, models. Now, we've heard that overseas development aid at 0.7% is not going to be the way uh, that, it, that it's done. But perhaps you could uh, give us some ideas of what are the options and uh, what are your preferred options? Yes, thank you, Claire. And I think it makes sense to come to the financing last, really, because it affects all the different systems we've been talking about. And, of course, universal health coverage isn't just about health financing. You've got to get all the other health systems right, be it the med medicine supplies, the human resources, the information technology. All that has to be right. But financing is pivotal to the whole thing. And if you get the financing wrong, you can just forget about universal health coverage. And this has been quite a you know, controversial topic, I think, over the years. Um, you saw about 20, 30 years ago, and it was really ideologically driven. The, the, the likes then of the World Bank were, were then uh, recommending to countries that they should push the financing burden onto individuals and households. So you saw like, countries like Ghana having uh, user fees imposed on them and, and their, their governments being told to cut public spending. Now, that was terrible advice, and, and I think that we've learned over the years, and you know, there have been shining examples of countries that have reached universal health coverage that have explicitly recognized that private financing won't get you to universal health coverage. Really because, if you go back to the definition, it's about everyone getting the health services they need with financial protection. That can only be achieved when healthy, wealthy members of society cross-subsidize services for the sick and the poor. And that's the whole range of services, preventive, right the way through to palliative care services. So you don't get those subsidies happening at scale in a sort of philanthropic world, you know, sort of where, you know, the rich might occasionally sort of help out the poor. You really need the state to force the healthy wealthy to cross-subsidise the, the sick and the poor. So really the financing transition to universal health coverage is exactly that. You're seeing countries replacing healthcare user fees, which are the worst way to finance a health system. And even private health insurance is not a good way to reach universal health coverage because it's a private transaction and you don't get the cross subsidies happening. What, what works is compulsory public financing where the main mechanisms are social health insurance, which in effect is a, is a payroll tax, um, and out of general taxation, which is the whole, whole range of taxes. And I think if you look at successful UHC models across the world now, um, they're using a hybrid of, of, of mechanisms. There used to be these terribly turgid rows between is the NHS system better than the, the, the German beverage system? And we recognise that our systems are now hybrids. You know, the last time we increased funding in the NHS, it was putting money on, on national insurance. And likewise, I think in Germany, it's been increasing in taxes. So the golden rule in UHC is about public financing and but then recognizing that moving to a public financing system is inherently political so that takes you into the whole realm of the political economy which perhaps we're not so good at and if you if you say it's public financing then you've got to what are you suggesting that you might tax because I read somewhere and a little knowledge is dangerous but that in <laughs> India they were taxing mobile phones and of course mobile phones can be very useful uh, for getting information mm -hmm. out about health mm -hmm. um, it can also be very useful in getting information out about uh, uh, disasters and disaster response so that would seem that it wasn't such a good idea uh, for example so there are things that they should tax and things that they shouldn't tax sure and this very much takes us into the realm of public financing so you know we, we come out of our comfort zone and are discussing the impacts of different policies um, on, on health um, and I think that um, we need to recognize that each country is, is unique and that they'll have their own context their own histories and institutions the, the labor market is often different uh, the level of natural resources is, is different uh, so you, you'll find that Botswana has been you know, relatively successful in reaching UHC because they've taxed their diamond reserves. 
uh, I would suggest that Nigeria, you know, a sensible way would be to tax their oil uh, revenues as well. But not all countries, you know, have those resources. So you are looking to mix your financing mechanisms depending on, on your system. But you're right, you don't want your tax, your, tax, uh, your tax system to be punishing the poor, and you need to be trying to tax more wealth and income rather than uh, indirect taxes. But then there are some good examples of increasing indirect taxes on, on sort of goods, for example, fossil fuels. Um, you know, we're, we're conscious that, that we should be thinking about the environmental impacts of what we're doing. Many countries subsidize fossil fuels, and that doesn't make any sense at all, you know, because the benefits tend to go to sort of car drivers, and it's bad for the environment. But removing fossil fuels is politically quite difficult. I know that, that Kenya recently has put VAT on fuel. But here we can be clever in the health sector and say that if you are introducing some unpopular taxes, to recycle those revenues and spend them on popular health reforms might be able to sweeten the pill of those tax reforms. So I think these are very much the issues we should be thinking of, Claire, about how do we get smarter in engaging in these discussions about public financing. I wonder whether you wanted to respond, Emmanuel, on the way that uh, you fund uh, your health service and uh, is it through these user fees that uh, uh, Robert doesn't like? Uh, is it through public funding? <laughs> what do you tax uh, yeah. um, to, 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 to get enough, uh, generate enough finances? It's yeah. actually evidence-based. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so thank you once again. Because Ghana is also even at the crossroads of our health financing. Currently, we are having very interesting conversations. But I'm sure most of you know we've, we have a national health insurance scheme which is one of the foremost in Africa. We do 2.5% VAT value added tax and also the National Health Insurance Levy. So that's former sector workers contribute through their SNIT and it's taxed through it. And also value added tax, because any product you buy, there's a percentage on it that reverts back to the National Health Insurance Scheme. This is what we've used, and in fact, we are celebrating our 15th anniversary this year, so a few months' time. But the challenge we've seen is that with time, we realized that it was just not adequate to finance the overall envelope, because we're covering about 95% of the disease conditions, with the exception of the cancers and a few uh, cosmetic surgeries and a few other things. Clearly, what is coming up now is that we need to recalibrate the whole national health insurance scheme. So we set up a presidential commission a few years ago. A report was brought out, which was looking at, do we have a package and finance a whole primary care package as a first year? And then have another tier where we are looking at maybe some level of co-insurance, co-payments, as a possible model, and then a third tier. This was a scenario we looked at. And then we also looked at the financing models. If we had to do a 1% increase in the levy, we realized it was going to bring about close to about 800 million, which was quite substantial. And then if we were to do employee, employee, 1% employer, 1% employee, that was also going to rake in about, when we did that tree analysis, close to about 400 million. Interestingly, we realized that the health tax that we, we really talk about this cook and all the same taxes, which is called in other settings, we normally see health tax. But in low middle income countries, like us is in the health economics literature, it's not substantial. It's very negligible, really. It's, and when we did that, actually it came up clearly that really it was not a drop in the ocean. But we realized that in high income country settings, it might be a bit substantial, as it were. But then we came back to the bottleneck again, because we, the trade unions, of course, will not agree to employ employees, so then you have to do all the navigation around the various trade unions to agree on some of these things. So we, we had to stall again in terms of that scenario. And the other thing we did with the National Health Insurance Scheme was that we also agreed that 10% of the National Health Insurance Fund should come back and fund priority health commodities. So in terms of our co-financing obligations, Global Fund, Gavi, and a few of those things. Because we've also done a transition plan, which is showing that government and external financing to these commodities between 2017, it's going to reduce from about $194 million to about $90 million. Meanwhile, co-financing obligations on government is going to increase from about $144 million in 2017 to about $350 million in 2025. So clearly, you see two graphs moving in the opposite side. So it really means government has to step up its game in the bit of transitioning, which is really in the spirit of the sustainable development goals, nations, domestic resource mobilization, and all that. So really, we are at a crossroads. That's why I say we are, we are really at a crossroads. And we also realize that even our national health insurance membership, after 
a lot of analysis and other, it, it's, it stagnated very close to 40 percent for a while. But in as much as we're looking for additional finance, and other, other issues we realize that we really need to plug the efficiency measures too. And that's one lesson that we want to, and other countries that, that have not tried. But clearly, we realized that we started the, the membership was doing it because people were finding it difficult to renew. They would renew for one year, but even the re renewal fee became a bottleneck for some people. And that's why contest becomes important. Because in some rural settings in a country where their basic economic product is, let's say, cuckoo, in October, November, when they sell the cocoa products, by March, they will see money from October to about March. After June, lean season. So really, if we're even doing contest-specific programs, we should have found a way of those communities could have paid their premiums just around the time that the cocoa season is up or where the cashew season is up. So that means a bit more of understanding the culture and economic activities of people. And that's why clearly we think we, in our dovetailing of policies, we should really examine the economic terrain of the country to induct, and making sure it fits the real settings. Because what we realized was that we went to some of the committees where, they, where the premium is being taken in June, and around the time they've spent all their cocoa or cashew money, they have no money to renew. So then and even people moving to renew was even a challenge. So in, in the next few weeks, we're going to launch a mobile renewal and which on the 19th of December, actually, where people can renew their smartphones. And we are also looking at fraud, because in my previous life, I used to do clinical auditing for the National Health Insurance Scheme. You go to audit the facilities, and you realize that a lot of them submit previous claims, claims that really don't exist. So how do you put in place systems? How do you make it punitive enough? So one of the quick things we did was write to Attorney General. They've been giving prosecutorial powers to also prosecute some of these cases in a rapid fashion, so that it serves as a deterrent to other people not to take the insurance scheme for granted. And also, the, we set up a committee that will be on the lookout also, go in a rapid fashion to look at the claims. The internal audit directory has been strengthened. And all these efficiency measures, we also realize, has led to some increase in revenues in some of the piloted places that have been tried. So broadly, these are some of the approaches Ghana has used. It was very broad yeah. there, Robert. <laughs> what, any, what's your uh, view on uh, what Ghana's... Ghana's absolutely fascinating because, as you were describing, I, th I think about 15 years ago, Ghana introduced uh, the, the National Health Insurance Scheme and reached 40% sort of quite quickly, and there was this great hope and expectation that this was going to sort of carry on. I, I think the sort of Ghana has uh, provided some really interesting lessons, particularly around the willingness and ability of people in the informal sector to, to make health insurance payments. And uh, I, I know that, that uh, you know, there's a view that, that people really ought to join the NHIS, but I think really the evidence from around the world is, is that, that poor people or near poor people don't buy health insurance you know, as much as we'd like them to. And one can sensitise as much as you like, that, you know, but if the price is too high and people's lives are often very risky and you know, that, that it, in many respects it makes sense for them to keep the money under the bed for whatever emergency will, will come next. So I think that sort of countries that have continued to take insurance con contributions off the informal sector have made them extremely small, almost tokenry. So one thinks of Rwanda and China, where the subsidy is more like 90%. And then they've also made it compulsory. They said, really, at this level, really, everyone should pay. And that's sort of showing that you, you, you can sort of get to much higher uh, you know, sort of coverage rates. I think the world is waiting with great expectation what might be happening in Kenya uh, in, in a couple of weeks, where President Kenyatta has just announced universal health coverage reforms, which I think are going to be launched in two weeks' time. And my understanding is the approach is slightly different in Kenya and, and in the, the counties that are piloting this, they are basically giving away the insurance cards to people in the informal sector practically. And I was just reading that, I think, in one of the counties, Kasumu has already reached 66% coverage and haven't even launched it yet. So I think this is a great opportunity for countries to learn from each other. Uh, but I'm, I'm very much of the view, really, that, that it's much better when you have a large informal sector to basically tax finance the informal sector, to use the resources from natural resources, maybe corporation taxes, and how important it is to really go for full population coverage because that way you get more people happy, you put more pressure on the system, 
and you get the politicians more interested. Because I was going to ask you about the politicians, because mm. you alluded to it, and, it, and it's been one of those light motifs. I think even Dr. Uh, Salama has said, you know, the problem that the uh, the health ministries have is that they don't always have the have the power, and they they have to go and persuade the finance uh, ministry uh, to, to to give them money. So, w what would be the solution? How do you make sure that something like universal health coverage is, uh, you know, fully funded? and that it, it isn't just uh, somebody like Emmanuel uh, who has to make the case. Sure, I'm delighted. And this is the, the area of work we're specialising in Chatham House, actually, to do a bit of ad advertising on the political economy of UHC reforms, you know, recognising that we do need these big injections of public financing. So how do you catalyse that? How do you suddenly get a sort of a doubling, maybe, of the health budget? And I think we're sort of learning lessons that it's like a dual strategy, uh, as Peter Salama alluded to, that persuading people about the investment case, the economic case, and, you know, sort of in terms of the workforce being more productive <clears throat> and um, reduced inequalities, re reduced uh, poverty due to health care costs, all those economic -y arguments to persuade the Ministry of Finance. But I'm of the opinion that that might not be enough and that unfortunately uh, we have to, to recognise that ministries of finance often don't like health, you know, that they prefer, I mean, I, I'm not just my African colleagues laughing here, but I, I worked in the Ministry of Health in Uganda for six years and every year we went to finance, you could see finance saying, oh no, here come health again, uh, asking for more money, it's a bottomless pit, we're not going to get any, uh, anything out of them. And I think that ministries of finance do have a tendency to prefer infrastructure and education. They see the link between education and economic growth, which, let's face it, is their, their sort of main thing, much more clearly. But perhaps our, our better tactic would be to employ a much more political approach and really be going up a level, to some extent bypassing the ministry of finance, and then putting it to presidents and, and you know, political leaders that to introduce mass popular UHC reforms that will take Ghana from like 40% coverage to 100% coverage will be hugely popular. And, and you know, to be quite brutally honest about this, there are votes in this and there's power in this. Now, heads of state and, and politicians, this is music to their ears. And I think there are so many strong arguments you can use about health reforms delivering quick wins, much quicker than in infrastructure and electrification and nebulous things like trade and employment. And, um, you know, we can show many examples of countries like sort of Thailand, um, you know, where mass UHC reforms took the, the country to practically 100% coverage, not only winning people elections, but turning them into national heroes. And so I think if we can be thinking about this dual strategy of promoting the economic benefits, but also selling the political benefits, you know, could be a good strategy. Is that what you told the Kenyans, that it was a vote winner? <laughs> well, I, I know that these conversations are, are taking place. You know, the, 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 uh, I think there are some um, agencies and some individuals now who recognise that UHC reforms are as much political as they are technical. I mean, I, I would even use the example of, of my own country where I'm sure you're all aware that we're, we're heading for this Brexit debacle <laughs> next week. Um, and, and lo and behold, you know, the, the government knows it needs political capital. And the NHS had a difficult winter last winter. And, you know, the call went out during the summer, we need more money for the NHS. And there was a big row between, it was all in the public domain, between our Chancellor and the Minister of Health about how much was going to be put into the NHS. And as we've been approaching this uh, political precipice, um, lo and behold, a lot of money was found to fund, uh, to fund the NHS through the winter um, to buy political capital. This happens in every country. And so I think we should be advising ministries of health to play that political card much more cleverly. Yes, indeed. Uh, every panel discussion has a Brexit, and it should be banned, I think, um, for the next uh, decade. Ilona, you wanted to pick up. Yeah, I wanted to add something, because we mustn't fall into one trap. And that is, on the one hand, we have this group of countries, and your countries also apply, that are on a good road to development. And, you know, we have a whole set of, you know, very large... Uh, uh, 
middle-income countries, whatever one calls them nowadays, and you see what's happening on investment in health in China. There are various different types of messages from India. But clearly, one can see that from the very top of government, it's understood that on our road to development, we need to start investing in health. There is no way away from it. And I think how we manage that politically, Dr. Tedros, of course, has just again done this at the G20, et cetera, and really saying, you know, guys, if you want to move there, and it is mainly men, if you saw the picture from the G20, uh, but, you know, this is what needs to be done. But we don't have a strategy for the fragile states. We don't have a strategy really for the poorest countries. And this is going to be a major challenge. And if we look you know, at the DRC situation, mm -hmm. if we look several years back at the three Ebola countries, if we see what is happening there, we need to find financial mechanisms whether the global community can agree that you know, we're talking about a global public good here and we have to work with these 30 to 40 countries to at least establish that basis that I see you know, Peter Salama also mm -hmm. spoke about, saying our best prevention against these outbreaks is a, a primary health care system. But I, I think we've, we've sort of got to see that. We've also got to see that in the developed countries, universal health coverage is not as well distributed uh, as sometimes is assumed. We know one very large country, the United States, where universal health coverage is still very far away. But we've just had an analysis from the Barcelona Center of the European Office of WHO to show how high co-payments are throughout Europe, particularly Eastern Europe, things we often don't think about. And the last point I want to raise, which just shows how complex it is, the fact is, if you have a fully tax-based system, you will see that if you are struck with austerity, your health care is going to, in most cases, go down. Unless you take a very, very conscious decision, like, for example, Finland did in a period of austerity, you're going to keep it up. And the UK experienced the other. And then, you know, your problems mount in parallel Whereas if you have a more mixed system uh, with you know, different modes of finance, and in some cases, uh, you know, social health insurance does uh, uh, have that, then you're slightly safer, mm, you're unless you know, your employment goes down like this, uh, than uh, uh, in, in terms. And so I think that's also a macroeconomic issue we have to look at. Because you know, not all countries are constantly going to be on the up. There's going to be crises now and again. And that's why in the wording of universal health coverage, long way to get there, is why we're saying we're talking about sustainable and resilient systems. And that's why also in terms of financing, we have to think very carefully you know, what are resilient forms of financing so that in the end, the poorest don't pay the price again. Well, thank you. I, I was just going to go to the audience, but please, if you'd like to uh, yeah, uh, to pick up, Gerald. Yeah, just to emphasize on, uh, what, on that, the majority of sub-Saharan Africa still has very low um, uh, um, allocation of um, government spending to health. Mm. Um, and as you, most of you know, the Abuja Declaration, which is over a decade ago, hasn't been achieved by majority of the sub-Saharan African countries. Apart from Rwanda in East Africa, none of the countries uh, have achieved that. So there is an issue of um, um, you know, uh, raising resources and then the political one of allocating those resources to health. And as Yates has just mentioned, you can have all those investment cases and everything, but eventually the decision is political. So we have to have a political process uh, with which we can persuade uh, our heads of states. Most of the heads of state controls uh, most of the decisions at cabinet meeting level, whereby um, allocation of resources between the ministries is discussed despite the um, fiscal arrangements that you may have there. There are many decisions which are political. 
So we uh, had a strategy uh, in the last elections which didn't work uh, because of the route which the elections took, was to use people living with NCDs uh, to advocate for, to make uh, allocation of resources to health um, an election issue, uh, both at grassroots level and even at presidential level. Um, issue being, uh, we calculated and so out of the about uh, 10 million voters, uh, about 4.8% of them were either hypertensive or diabetic or living with an NCD of some sort, including some parliamentarians and, uh, and, 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 and politicians. So if we made that an agenda to start with access to essential medicines and inclusion of NCDs at primary uh, care and the essential medicine list and primary care level, from the uh, uh, ward assembly, that's the lowest level of representation, all the way to county level and national level. Then we would sort of get some political attention to it. Given that the cycles of election are every five years, uh, some of the health investments take longer than five years. So it doesn't persuade many politicians mm. uh, to make decisions on health rather than you know, more flashy ones like, um, like a road or something like that. And if it's health, it will be a building uh, which may not solve the real problems of health, or a CT scanner, or some commodity of some sort, which don't really represent universal health coverage. So eventually it's a political decision. Mm. Secondly, even when the resources are allocated to health, we have very inefficient uh, methods um, of, uh, of, of financial flows. Majority of the total health expenditure in our region uh, comes from out of pocket from households. So. Uh, like was mentioned, how do we ensure that we capture people into uh, a health insurance system? I like what Ghana is doing, but even in Kenya where we have declared, trying to get the informal sector, which employs most of the youth, and the youth are the majority in the country, uh, into a national insurance platform uh, is a challenge and will be a challenge for some time to come. The national health insurance uh, system itself, uh, how the resources are allocated. Majority of the resources are being allocated to equipment. And as I mentioned, uh, for NCDs, majority of the best buys are not in equipment. Mm. So we need to really translate our policies into financial actions uh, in proportion, in, 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 in appropriate proportions. So that what you say in policy is actually how you allocate your financial resources and action. Understood. Emmanuel, a quick point, then Svetlana, and then the audience, and then uh, we'll go to our keynote uh, closing remarks. Okay, so very quickly, I, I have some few doubts, and I've raised this in several fora. As one of the key things that happened to the 21st century is the age of design. And that means design of institutions, design of agreements, and even design of treaties. I'm also saying this for a reason. I think sometimes a health conversation about most Ministry of Finances so will help us a huge budget. Health and education taking a huge chunk of the budget. It's also about the design. It's the design of how we've put the health budget. For the question that what, what business are we in? Is it health or healthcare? If it's health, it really goes beyond the Ministry of Health in most countries. Because if we are building health infrastructure, why can't that budget be in the budget of the Ministry of Works and Housing? Because it's infrastructure. If we are buying ambulances, there's a Ministry of Transport. That budget can be in the Ministry of So is it is about the designing of how we even that design alone can even reduce our health budget and even make a case for advocating for more. So we really need to rethink really about the design of how we make the health budget. Because we put everything on health, you go to the health budget, you see the housing, you see the infrastructure, you see the solar lamps they want to install, salaries, salaries and salaries fine, but the solar lamps, there's a ministry of energy. That solar lamps budget can be in the ministry of energy budget. So yes, exactly, yeah, so it needs you, to go to the so other ministries, it. So it needs to be spread. Exactly, it needs to be spread. Because really, the future of health is really, really going to be a lot of non-health. If we are building KFIT clubs, which will help the NCDs, it's the Ministry of Youth and Sports. So we really need to look at the design of how we've conventionally done our health budget and approach the Ministry of Finance. Thank you. I think it's very apt that we go back to the WHO, <laughs> as it's uh, universal health coverage is uh, one, of, one of your priorities. So please, Svetlana. Yeah, thank you very much. I just want to say, 9.6 million lives could be safe investing in the best buys by 2025. 9.6 million lives. 
That is the number. If we have this ambitious SDG 3.4 to reduce by one third the primary mortality from densities, we have to invest in the best bias. And today we have heard the different examples from the countries and from uh, uh, we, we heard the intervention from Ilona and others about the investment in health. That is the key <coughs> issue. Investing in health that, is, that will return to the old best bias. Thank you very much. Really, it's very important. Thank you. If I could ask the audience uh, for their, to raise their hand. Yes, there is a, a lady in front of me. Uh, if you could say your name and yes. who you would like to answer your question. Um, well, actually, it's to the whole panel. My name is uh, Shanali Johnson. I am the head of advocacy at the Union for International Cancer Control. I am very pleased to hear the discussion about NCDs happening here. We've heard it in the first panel and now. Um, my question, and actually it's a comment and a question, is that there's a big focus on prevention of NCDs. And certainly when you work in cancer, that is a bit worrying because only uh, some uh, risk factors are in fact modifiable. Age, for example, is one, a main risk factor for cancer. You see a higher incidence in cancers as you get older. Um, in childhood, childhood cancers are not preventable, yet that's a major issue for both developing countries and developed countries. So if we're only looking at prevention in UHC, we are not looking at a whole picture. And actually for cancer control, you could say that early detection is one of the most effective forms of cancer control. So um, how can we better address the continuum of NCD control for man prevention and management and have that as part of, of UHC? I would be very interested in your comments, thanks. Is that one for you, Svetlana? Yes, why not? You are responsible for NCDs uh, for the WHO. You can. Uh, yes. So, uh, yes, really, thank you very much that you raised this very important question. And the prevention of the cervical cancer now is one of the flagships of the WHO. We launched this flagship during this uh, uh, World Health Assembly. So, uh, how we could prevent HPV, HPV vaccination, of course, and that is that is should be under the umbrella of UHC. And of course, that is the key point that we have not only work our uh, only work with the ministers of health. We have to work very closely with the different other uh, ministers, such as education, social, and others. If you are speaking about the childhood cancer and how we could prevent, yes, it is really not so easy exercise. But monitoring and regular um, visit to the doctors, visit to the pediatricians could find this uh, uh, disease in the early stage and it could be really prevented. We know that the numbers is that the childhood cancer is the, sometimes is uh, better treated than the cancer that is uh, diagnosed on the adults. So that is why the focus on the primary health care, especially on the cancer issue, is extremely important. Thank you very much. If, uh, yes, there was, the lights are uh, not good. Is there somebody at the back who's raising their hand? Or, it's quite difficult actually from here to see who's raising, yeah, thank you. Uh, is there, yes, please, yeah, if you could you. say it's your name and it, who you'd like to answer your questions. It is more the questions, but it is short comment anyway. E education, such as health, two main pillar, two challenges for governments and the states. Two sectors need finance, of course, and two sectors for the middle term and the long terms. But we should preserve and safeguard education, education and healthcare, such we can promote public health and pu promoting public health by education. And, but let's think, but we should be aware that two sectors are vulnerable for corruptions. Thank you. I cannot see, I don't know whether the panel can. Um, Ilona, can you, I yes. think that's actually very important because first of all, and you take the World Bank activities now on human capital saying, you know, we need the very strong investment both in health and education and that they should not be competing with each other. You know, we are more important than you are. And that becomes a very, very important strategy, of course, that's one thing. The other thing which is a problem in tax-based systems is that if you look at the distribution of where the tax money goes, 
what is happening, and I did a fair bit of work in Australia where it was always the problem, is that you know, the, the health budget goes up and up and up, and the other sectors say, you know, and then you come along and say health in all policies, and the others you know, start to say, what? You know, look at us, housing is going down, and in some cases, education is going down, and all the money, um, you know, a lot of the money is going into health, is going into treatment rather than prevention and into a sector where one third is waste. Uh, so I, I think you know, we've, uh, we've got to become astute. We've got to be very precise also where our systems are not functioning and be very open, transparent, honest, and accountable. Because otherwise, given you know, the whole situation with we don't like elites and we don't like evidence and we don't like all kinds of things and definitely we don't like vaccination, if we are not credible advocates within the healthcare sector, we are going to lose the population. And in order to have a solidarity-based system, you need the trust of the people in that system. And through that, it again becomes a political argument. If you have a corrupt health system, then people will not trust it. And those who can just about afford it will go and spend their money somewhere else. We found that happening in Brazil, which had one of the best public health systems. So I think thinking of those political dimensions is, is very, very important. And seeing you know, what's the consolidated investment we need in order to move forward. Thank you. Yes. Because another thing to consider, of course, is, is that as populations age and new technologies come along, it is practically inevitable as a society we will spend more money on health. That you know, th this is a this is a truth. You see, it's right across the world that as countries get richer, they spend more money on health. And we, you know, one thinks of elderly people who want to keep going and and you know stay active. They have less interest in sort of exotic foreign travel, maybe, and sort of buying capital goods. But they they really this is the case of my parents. You know, they I feel they almost live at the doctors. You know, but they're not hypochondriacs. They just want to keep going. So you know, this is inevitable that as a society, we will spend more money on health. But the, the very important thing is to recognize it will be much cheaper for society if that financing of those health services remains public, predominantly public. And of course, this is one of these great ironies. We sometimes hear this said in the UK that we can no longer afford the NHS. You know, the, the population is aging, and therefore we must sort of stop these socialized systems and allow the market to take over. But I mean, that's crazy. Because then you end up with a US-style health system spending 18% of its GDP and a third of that on administration. So we need to be sort of realistic about the arguments, <laughs> accepting that it's a sign of a civilized society that they do spend more money on sort of elderly people to keep them healthy. But it's much better for all of us that that's done through public financing rather than letting the private sector take over, which will be woefully inefficient. Well, thank you very, very much. And I think that indeed it is a road, it's a journey to universal health coverage and uh, to actually achieving this SDG. I would like to thank our panel for their very incisive, slightly provocative uh, uh, talks. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm sorry, I've just got a light in my eye, so I can't see anybody, so if there's one, yeah, thank you. I feel as if I'm being, I don't know whether you're feeling as if you're being interrogated by that light. So uh, apologies, I didn't, oh, I still can't see you. But just say your name and uh, who you would like to uh, I'll answer okay. the question. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Tofik Sedi Mosekam. I'm from the permanent mission of Iran here in Geneva. I would like to thank the, uh, all the panelists for their informative discussions, uh, which were very useful. The issue of universal health coverage and uh, particularly NCDs are at the uh, heart of the activities of the uh, WHO at the moment. And uh, we, ha we have seen many plans and uh, uh, strategies coming from the WHO on this particular issue. Professor Kickbush uh, mentioned about the challenges for in, in, on the way for realizing and uh, materializing the universal health coverage. 
and among which she mentioned uh, the fragile situations, which of course are, are very true. One important uh, aspect which is missing perhaps, and I believe in my view it is the, the heart of the matter, and the core issue is about development, which uh, makes universal health coverage and tackling NCDs a major challenge for many countries in the world, being, I mean, even industrialized or less industrialized, developed or underdeveloped. So this is something that needs further attention and it needs a global action, basically. It is not something that the WHO can do it or even independent countries, sovereign countries can do it by themselves. It needs a collective effort, uh, in my view, and this is something that needs to be taken into account as also a major challenge for uh, materializing the universal health coverage. Uh, Thank the you world. very Thank much you. for your comment and indeed I think that it is, it's uh, medical, it's humanitarian, uh, it's development, it's uh, private sector, it's everybody who has to get their thinking caps on on how this particular SDG goal is going to be met and Ilona you would like to say yeah, something just, before we really yeah. wrap up now. Absolutely, <laughs> uh, it's just that it's a really nice closing because it takes us back to what Svetlana said earlier that you know, we have this unique historical opportunity with the SDG uh, General Assembly high level meeting next September to actually try and craft such a consensus. And that is going to be you know, a tremendous challenge because the world right now is not in the mood for multilateral action. And uh, there is more divergence than there used to be. So I think for all of us here to be very, very aware of what's at stake at that UN high-level meeting, to advocate, to prepare one's governments, to prepare the various alliances we are in, to be able to move forward and to support the WHO in that effort, and we at UHC 2030 try to do that as well. I think that is really the message. We have a chance to craft such a consensus and we must use that as a historical opportunity. We won't get it again so quickly. Thank you. So I'd like to thank our panelists very much for their contribution. Uh, and it's been a wide ranging discussion because we've seen how complex it is actually uh, to attain this goal of universal health coverage. So I'd like to give a round of applause to our uh, speakers. And I'd like to ask the Vice President of Global Public Policy of the IFPMA Council and of Merck, Jeff May, to make the closing remarks. I'm really up here as the chair of the IFPMA Council, uh, and it's a pleasure to have the chance to, to close what has been a tremendous uh, discussion this afternoon. Um, I found the, the panelists to be not only experts, but very insightful in the remarks that they gave us. I think, Claire, you did a tremendous job. At, it's not easy being the moderator uh, and, and helping to push things forward. So please give me one more round of applause for them. And Claire, I'm glad you didn't have a plate of cookies next to that uh, Coke. But that's in my handbag. There, there, there could have been a riot breakout. I'm sorry, Philippe, uh, <laughs> our friends from France. That's not funny. Um, so I'm the last speaker before we go to a reception. And please, all of you, uh, make use of that. We can continue the discussion together uh, there. Uh, in their wisdom, the IFPMA team cut down my two-hour remarks to just one hour. Uh, so uh, we'll be able to get to the reception quickly. But in all seriousness, I hope each and every one of you were able to gather uh, something, uh, a nugget or two that really resonates with you uh, from the discussions today about really complex and difficult topics. I certainly did. I uh, just want to share just a couple of thoughts. Um, first of all, as I was listening to some of the speakers, I was thinking about my, uh, one of my favorite plays, Hamilton, uh, which is basically the story of two American politicians in the late 1700s uh, that were uh, first friends when earlier in their careers and then became enemies. And at the time that they were both lawyers in New York City, uh, one of them, Aaron Burr, uh, went up to Alexander Hamilton, the other, 
Um, and Alexander was pretty brash, uh, pretty confident, uh, and Aaron Burr was more uh, quiet and uh, you could say scheming. And uh, Aaron Burr said to uh, Alexander Hamilton, speak less, listen more. And it resonated with me because I think what we really need to take away is that we need to listen more and think about the problems that we're facing. And as uh, Dr. Solana said, um, really listen to the local ground efforts, what's happening, what the needs are, and have that be a continuous cycle of learning as we go along. And I think there are some other things that jumped out at me about the partnership and the need to have uh, strong partnerships in trying to go at this uh, effort and coming at these issues humbly and not feeling as if we're uh, experts and know everything going into it, uh, but have a long range of learnings to carry out. What uh, I'm pleased to say is that these ideas, these concepts have played very much into uh, the approach the industry is taking with Access Accelerated and moving that effort forward. So we thought we could end with just a short video that covers that program and I think will capture some of the points that I just illustrated. So if we could go to the video. Accelerated gives the international biopharmaceutical industry a strong, coordinated voice to advance prevention and treatment of NZDs in low and middle income countries. We put patients at the center as we work to increase access to appropriate quality care and support the strong health systems needed to deliver it. We bring more than 20 international biopharmaceutical companies together with national governments, multinational organizations, civil society, and local stakeholders to develop bold, proactive ideas, giving industry a seat at the table to share expertise and catalyze action, so that together we can reach the millions of people living with NCDs in low and middle income countries worldwide. We unite our members and partners in a coordinated global response that tackles every aspect of NCD prevention, diagnosis, treatment and care, aligned with patient needs and local priorities. And together we can achieve what no one company could accomplish on its own. In Kenya, we're supporting people and patients to turn commitments on NCDs into action. We're working with the World Bank and Ministry of Health to pilot a basic package of integrated NCD services that can be sustainably financed and scaled nationally. And we're identifying opportunities for our member companies to leverage their expertise and experience. For example, strengthening supply chains in Kenya. Building on lessons learned in Kenya, this successful model is already scaling to Ghana and Vietnam to further catalyze global efforts to address NCDs. Access Accelerated recognized the critical need for a central platform that brings together data and information about the NCD burden to help increase coordination among many stakeholders working to fight NCDs. The Access Accelerated Open Platform works to meet this need. The Open Platform harmonizes and centralizes the most recent information available about NCDs from multiple sources and is a gateway for stakeholders at the global, national and local levels to access information and learnings to help address their specific contextual needs. The platform works to drill down to the facility level to better understand, coordinate and partner to improve the patient journey. By transparently sharing information and learnings, the open platform can support and accelerate capacity building, communications, advocacy monitoring and evaluation to benefit all people and partners and can help us meet the ambitious NCD targets set by the UN Sustainable Development Goals together. Access Accelerated envisions a future where no one dies from a preventable and treatable disease. With bold ideas, cooperation and a focus on patients, we can and will make this vision a reality.
So I hope you uh, take advantage of the open platform that we've developed uh, and go to it and, and check out the information that has been collected. And I hope, uh, Ilona, um, that you gave us today a so-so ranking uh, as an industry. I, I'm hoping over time we can uh, increase that to uh, hopefully at least a gentleman's B or something of that nature. Um, but in all seriousness, we, we do appreciate uh, the need for us to continue to evolve uh, in the way that we interact and move things forward. Um, I'm going to end you with a cautionary note. In the play that I referenced in Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton did not take Aaron Burr's advice, and he went on over time to become a, a huge critic of Burr and the political contest, and ultimately was killed by Burr in a duel. So let that be a, a cautionary note that we <laughs> all need to be good listeners or there could be consequences. I certainly want to thank all of the audience today for being such great listeners uh, to uh, the discussion we had today. So we'll end on this note and go to the reception.